I didn't really feel really there. I was just being dressed and moved to school and then back home, walking up a hill to school every morning and just dragging my feet along the floor, feeling completely detached from my body, like it was just an object that I was dragging around with me. You felt quite dissociated. Yeah, I just felt like really stiff in my body because it was too much to feel all the pain that was actually in my body at that time. The pain was on account of... All the abuse. I used to look out of the window a lot, dreaming about the trees and the leaves. I just sometimes had this safe place in my mind where I just picture being in sunshine and that made me feel calm. But I just remember staring out the window and being told not to daydream. Yeah, it's strange how similar our experiences are in that respect. And it's probably true of many children who grew up at the time. And that was that I would often do the same thing. I would often look out of the window at school. I wanted really to be anywhere else apart from home. I definitely didn't want to be there. I was being abused at home as well, but I was being sexually abused at the school. I remember staring out of windows at the school, just like you say it, looking at trees and the sky and things like this, and being told to stop daydreaming and pay attention and these kind of things. Mm. It was as if the teachers at the school had absolutely no understanding of child psychology. Mm. They didn't understand... I mean, those who weren't sexually abusing me, they didn't understand the reason why I was staring out the window is because I was traumatised, deeply traumatised on account of all the abuse that had been happening to me. It was a very strange place to be, to be constantly attacked and reprimanded for all of the symptoms of abuse. In my primary school, a caretaker who abused me and some other children when I was five years old, because I remember we were reading a poem And I remember at the bottom it said anonymous, and that's exactly how I felt. I remember after that I just threw up everywhere onto the table and taken to hospital that day. Difficult day for me, I think. I just felt so unseen, so anonymous, so invisible. And then there was that reaction from my body. And then I remember being taken to an abuser's house, lying on the sofa in agony, And I remember drawing a letter I on my stomach, thinking to myself, I have an eye pain, I have an eye pain. And I remember thinking it's not an eye pain like my eye with which I see, it's in the core of my being. And I remember sending a message to myself in the future and remember this, remember, remember this pain and how alone I was then. Mm, Yeah, pain in the core of your being. I can relate to that. It's also interesting you mentioned throwing up. That was something that I did many times at school. I think my body was reacting in a very extreme way to the abuse that was occurring and it was doing everything it could to signal to those around that this was happening. I didn't have the words to describe what was happening. I was also threatened to keep quiet by members of my family and by teachers at the school. But I remember one time, similar to how you described that, At the beginning of the day, there was an assembly where everyone in the school met and they sung some songs and announcements were made. I remember at this assembly, I threw up in the middle of assembly. What my body was doing there was making the strongest statement it possibly could against what was happening at the school. Sometimes I would just react in the wrong way. Sometimes when I was really sad, I would just laugh, do the the wrong reaction to things because it was just, I think, because it was just so confusing what kind of emotion I was meant to play at any one moment that all the emotions got mixed up Mm. and it was kind of absurd a lot of the time. Yeah, I think there was a bizarre contrast between the superficial appearance of things at school and what was going on for me underneath the surface, what the teachers were doing to the students. Several of the teachers were sexually abusing students and yet we would meet every morning. There'd be this pretense of unity, this pretense of community But it wasn't a community at all. It was a system of exploitation in which a power dynamic between student and teacher was exploited by many of the staff there. It's also interesting to me that you mentioned that in your primary school, a caretaker sexually abused you and others at at that location. Because I also had the same experience at my primary school. And I also have another friend who had the same experience with a caretaker at a primary school. It makes a lot of sense because I've begun to realise that those who seek to sexually abuse children purposely infiltrate schools in which they can do that. However, I would say that in my secondary school, paedophiles did not sneak into the school. The school participated in that abuse. 
from the headmaster downwards. The headmaster was charged with sexually abusing children, with raping children. I've begun to ask the question, as I have about things like the Catholic Church and the Scout Movement, and the question is, to what extent does the school system itself invite and support the abuse of children? What do you feel? I have a kind of mixed opinion because there, I still see there were positive things for me happening at school. Like I remember teachers who would read stories and that was something that I really enjoyed and that helped me a lot. And the structure of it helped me and seeing some close friends helped me. And I had some good English teachers along the way who helped me a lot. There was a, the most a lot of abuse happening just from the other students through bullying and repetition of abuse that they'd experienced. So that, for me, the terror was more the other students. The primary school that I went to was a state school. And at that school, I was only abused by one person, sexually abused by one person, and that was that caretaker. However, at the private school, which was King's House School in Richmond in London, I was abused by multiple teachers, and the school itself seemed to be a paedophile ring. It's interesting to explore the reasons why public schools, which means, for those who are listening outside of the UK, which means a school that is paid for, which a private school in essence, um, which is a bizarre twist of the language, because really a public school should be a state school, school yeah. and a private school is the one you pay for. So, I mean, there's already a linguistic deception that's being practiced in the naming of the schools. In my experience, it was exploitative right from the start. And as soon as you're asking citizens to pay for education, which should benefit the entire community, as soon as you're saying, OK, no, there's this elite group of people who will get a better education because they pay more. As soon as you say that, there's already an exploitation taking place once that rhythm or resonance gets set off of course it's a magnet for paedophiles as we've seen with so many schools in the uk i invite listeners to go online and take a look at how many private schools in the uk have been rife with paedophiles and i think it has also a lot to do with the fact that i feel like they have less structures in place how they select the teachers yeah i don't, I don't really know the, yeah. the process by which they select the teachers mm. all i know is that I mean, I can give you stories of the kind of things that went on. There was a history teacher, for example, this is just one example, a history teacher called Mr. Newman, who would openly spank children in the middle of the class. He would walk around the classroom, twist children's hair, he'd drag them to the front of the class, he'd put them over his knee, and he'd spank them in the middle of the class. Also raped me on other occasions. Completely supported by the school. There was no questions asked about what he was doing. Other teachers were physically and sexually violent as well, and it appeared to be not some strange aberration, not some unusual phenomenon that had somehow crept through under darkness into the school and was unfurling itself in some dark and forbidden manner. But it was invited through the front door. It was supported. It was the headmaster. Wow. Yeah, I mean... In that way, our experiences were different because for me, the majority of the classes were peaceful and the teachers were there to teach you subjects. It, maybe it had to do with the time frame as well because my experiences were later. But I also remember as a kid walking past your school because our schools were very close to each other. I remember thinking, all oh, those poor boys... They looked so sad. King's House School was and may well still be a horrifying and decrepit place, a place of no love and a place that to this day fails to take any action about the rife paedophilia that exists within its institutional walls. We talked about it in an earlier podcast, but several times I have put information on the school's Wikipedia page relating to how many paedophiles operated in that space and the school continues to do nothing to do nothing this is today this is 2018 this is the time in which we're supposed to be radically aware of the effect that sexual abuse of children has on the psyche of children and the consequences that it has for our entire planet the consequences of sexually abusing that number of children and then sending those children out to occupy elite positions of power as king's house school in london does it's unbelievable that nothing's been done it's astonishing to me that at this point in history, there's still such a great and overwhelming cover-up of the abuse of children. It was very strange at King's House School in Richmond. I remember being excluded from classes on account of the fact that I was being disruptive. 
But the reason I was being disruptive is because teachers at the school were sexually abusing me and I was signalling through my behaviour that I was being sexually abused. But I think the problem was that I was often reprimanded by the headmaster, a man called Mr Chaplin, who has been charged with raping children. And he would often issue punishments or exclude me from classes. He wrote in one report that I needed psychological help. I can put a photo of this report on the website along with the notes for this podcast so that people can read it, so that listeners can really understand how these people operate, how they cover up their crimes. But he wrote in this report that I needed psychological help. So a man that was running a school, a man who was raping children at school, he wrote in the report of one of the boys who was at the school being abused. That boy was me. He wrote, this boy needs psychological help. A man who was raping children suggested that I needed psychological help and then excluded me from lessons. I just wonder how many children they did this to, how many children they're still doing it to. They haven't reflected or spoken out or shown any sign whatsoever that they have taken any action. It's kind of disturbing what happens in so many of these elite London schools. I think sooner or later the rug will be pulled back. I think it is being pulled back. I think they're on borrowed time. I remember my cousins went to kind of similar schools to maybe that you went to. And I just remember I used to cycle past one of them and I felt like it just had such a dark energy about it that from knowing this one cousin as well and the way there was, it just felt like he had maybe had very similar experiences to you at the school. There was this thing called detention at school. So if you did something that they didn't agree with, and generally that was if you did something in a class that was disruptive, which basically meant that you were doing something that was reacting to the abuse they were subjecting the children to, then they would put you in something called detention. And detention was where you were made to stay after school alone with a teacher who would often sexually abuse you. So many, many times I was sent to something called detention, which was an opportunity for those teachers who had abused me, who had caused me to act out in class, to then abuse me again as punishment for having shown signs of having been abused. I don't know if the school still performs this operation, but it's kind of shocking to operate a system where if a child reacts to the rapes and sexual abuse that the teachers in a school are subjecting them to, that child then has to stay behind after school, alone with a teacher, and be abused again. I think it's deeply, deeply concerning that no one has taken a very, very hard look at how King's House School and other schools like it operate, the ways in which they are institutionally designed to sexually abuse children. Yeah, that I think in many ways, children that act out by disrupting things or showing their distress in that way that's one way of expressing it but there's also another way of acting in in a way and just becoming silent and I think that's how I showed it more was just by being invisible and not speaking I learned that to to survive and to somehow distract myself from what was happening I became a good student spending all my time on school and homework trying to do the best that I could because I felt oh maybe my parents will love me if I do that and I guess it was just a way of keeping my mind occupied from from the abuse and that way that also didn't help me out very much because it felt like because I was doing well and I had good grades no one took notice of how depressed I was, how sad I was the whole time, that barely had any friends or that I was being bullied. I feel like my first reaction to the sexual abuse in terms of expressing that at school was disruptive behaviour. Except it would be weird to call it disruptive behaviour because what was I actually disrupting? I was disrupting a paedophile ring, in my view. I was disrupting the means by which the paedophile ring disguised its operation, as in it disguised its operation through running classes, which it called science and it called maths and it called English. But actually those classes were a front for a paedophile ring. So I was disrupting the front for a paedophile ring. And then later, I think, when I was eventually so abused 
that I had learned that it was pointless to speak out at school, I became very insular and I became very introspective and I became very dissociated. And at that point, I did begin to, like you describe, become very quiet and become invisible. I did decide at some point invisibility or my attempt to be invisible is probably the best step at this point. It felt like every effort that I made to speak out, every effort that I made to indicate that abuse was happening, was met with more abuse. And then I think eventually I learned it was better not to do anything at all. 